Thank you, Governor. I've always referred to him as Governor, so I, I work for him. And it's great to be here, and it's great. Although, um, Michael met me first as a young cup reporter, and very quickly a young cup editor, I hope that point out. The first time I actually met Kitty was at uh, her son's third grade birthday party, and I was introduced to her as my cousin. Is my cousin because actually, and only she understands it. There's some very strange uh, family connection we have, and so it's great to be here with Kitty and with the faculty at Northeastern and, and all of you. And I do want this to be a conversation. Um, I took the assignment very literally. I was asked, I, I thought of it if either Deval Patrick or Charlie Baker, for that matter, the other two candidates, were to ask me the day after the election, let's say, what should they do? Uh, what, what would I say? And I orga I'm organizing my thoughts in two major streams, and I'm going to focus mostly on the second one. And the first has to do with protecting the extraordinary advances that we've made in coverage in Massachusetts, which I've really worked very hard on, both personally, professionally, and organizationally. And then uh, the focus has to and must turn to the single kind of driving imperative uh, in our community, which is about healthcare costs. And there, I think, A, government has to understand much better than it does today what is driving costs. Two, we need to think about um, how do we balance our, the regulatory role of government and the role of the market. And I, I, I'm the first speaker here, but I, I'm going to represent the center, I think, today. And, and by that, I, I, having spent a lot of time um, uh, with Professor Herzlinger before. She is someone who both understands the market and knows what it can achieve. And having spent many years with the governor, I know he's someone who has great confidence in uh, what the government can do as regulator. And I'm going to try to pose a middle ground there. And then ultimately, I think the, the community in this commonwealth needs to come together in a way that it did under coverage reform and it has not done on the issue of cost and affordability and come up with a community solution. And I think the heart of that solution will be fundamentally to change the way that everyone plans, government, families, employers pay for health care. And that in the absence of that, we won't really have a solution. So let me get back to that. And I'm, I, I know that we're each going to try to talk for about 20 minutes and have a discussion. So first of all, on the coverage issue, it's hard to underestimate what we've accomplished here in Massachusetts. So even in this state, which had one of the lowest rates of uninsured in the country, we were still up at 10 and 11%. And in a few short years after the passage of a universal health care law in 2006, we're now down to under 3% of the population is uninsured. You know what the number is in Texas? It's 25%. In California, it's 15%. One out of every four people in Texas has no health insurance. And that's of legal citizens. So this is an extraordinary accomplishment, but it's not just about the numbers. Everything has improved. Access to coverage has improved. Uh, ethnic and racial disparities in coverage, which health policy experts had considered one of the most intractable problems, has improved substantially in Massachusetts. We still have disparities in access to care, but access to coverage has improved substantially. The public still supports this, and despite the extraordinary budget pressures that state government and local government has been under. We preserve this game, and it's really something extraordinary. And while in Washington, it was really not a very <coughs> politic to use Massachusetts as the example, it was the example. It was the backbone of the federal bill, and, and that's an important progress. So a lot to celebrate and protect there. But the federal law does raise a lot of questions. It's a big, heavy law. And there's one number that's very important to the law. Anyone know what that number is? Not the number of pages. Not the number of provisions. It's the number of times the phrase, the secretary shall, appears in the law. And I point that out just to say that the passage of a law, as you, you who are following public policy know, is just the first step. And it's actually the rulemaking that follows that can be even more important and significant. And in this case, the rulemaking is going to be critical. And we've already seen an activist, very activist, Secretary of Health and Human Services, who sometimes, I feel, wants to be the federal insurance commissioner more than she wants to be the 
federal secretary of HHS. And although the federal law was modeled on the Massachusetts law, there are a lot of differences. And the new governor is going to have to spend some time assuming that the federal law remains and persists. Uh, the new governor is going to have to spend some time thinking about the differences in the two. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but I just want you to know that at multiple levels, these are very different laws. The individual mandate that requires people to purchase coverage is much uh, stronger in Massachusetts and perhaps should be even stronger and is very weak at the federal level. The employer responsibilities are different and may result in different incentives for employers to act. The level of subsidies are different, although Massachusetts has a very general level of subsidy. The actual federal law goes above it, so we'll have to reconcile that. The idea of what's called in the federal law exchanges and what Massachusetts <coughs> we know to be the connector, the, the, the public marketplace where uh, insurance policies are sold to individuals and potentially to small businesses are structured very differently, and the state's going to have to decide on that. And there are a number of other insurance issues which are very different uh, from the federal and the state law. And so the new governor is going to have to protect the gains we've made Think about the implications of all those new rulemaking at the federal level and reconcile the two bills. But I think those are all achievable, they're doable, and I think the community of Massachusetts that came together to support the coverage reform will stay together to support this. And it's actually been remarkable, and when I do a, uh, other talks on this, I, I would show you the, the photograph. When the president signed this bill, there's not a single Republican in the picture. And the photograph of Governor Romney signing the bill has multitude, and it was a bipartisan bill, labor, <coughs> business, hospitals, physicians, health plans, consumer, all coming together. That didn't happen at the federal level. And that's why I think our law has resisted uh, attacks, and the federal law is so vulnerable to attacks because it didn't have the broad base support. But when the governor gets done with that, when the governor gets done with protecting the law and reconciling it, the governor must turn to the issue of affordability because it is, uh, it is an urgent problem. And if you think about who are the, the three groups that pay for health insurance in this nation and in this commonwealth, employers, <coughs> government itself, federal, state, and local, and families. And they're all, they're all breaking under the burden. And so whether it's from employers or municipal budgets, there are 29 students in my daughter's sixth grade Spanish class this year Newton, Massachusetts, and there's one reason, because healthcare is eating up all the free, all, any available revenue that local cities and towns have, and it's, it's, a, it's a burden, it's an incredible burden for families and especially for small employers, and so this is what the government's going to have to deal with, and what I would suggest to you is that although Massachusetts was perfectly positioned to deal with the coverage issue, it's a, we're, it, we're going to have a hard time dealing with the cost issue, because you are right now you know, a quarter mile from the most expensive center of healthcare in the most expensive state, in the most expensive nation. And Reggie would know a lot more about this because she's actually studied a lot of comparative health and, and she can tell you why in some of these other nations they've actually figured out some really innovative solutions to solve both the coverage and the affordability question. We have not, and in Massachusetts, let's even assume that we could afford where we are today that this was actually acceptable to pay this much for health care and get of some questionable value, um, the growth rate is unsustainable. And so Massachusetts per capita health care costs are expected to double by 2020. So imagine as, as big a burden as it is on families and employers and government today, that's just going to grow exponentially. And there will be no money left for other government priorities, whether it's police and fire protection or the environment or transportation or education. And so we have a real problem on our hands. But I think the most disturbing kind of economic news is in this chart, so I'm gonna take a second to explain it. That top line, the blue line, represents the percentage increase of met, what we call medical trend. So how much are healthcare costs growing year over year at Blue Cross Blue Shield? And this, this chart would look identical for Harvard Pilgrim or Tufts or for that matter, for government. So it's been growing at 11 to 12% per year. It's coming down modestly to the 10 or 9% range. That's not good news for anyone. And I went out this week as part of my job as a new CEO and met with a top customer of Blue Cross. And I had a CEO of a 3,000 person high tech firm basically slam 
his premium renewal down on the table, which was at 12%, and he said, I can't afford this. I can't afford this. There's no part of my budget that's growing at 12%. They're mostly growing 1%, 2%, and 3%. And the red line represents workers' wages in Massachusetts, and I suspect that number is even a little inflated and it's going to come down further, and that bottom line is overall inflation. So you have to ask yourself, how is it that we can allow healthcare costs to grow three, four, or five times the rate of wages and the rate of inflation? I'd say we can't. We simply cannot. Um, so if the governor is going to sit down and tackle this issue of affordability and try to deal with this cost problem, um, in a way that we as a community came together and dealt with the coverage problem in a way that no other state has done. I think the governor's going to have to understand three things. One, what is actually underneath, what is driving the costs? Secondly, how do you figure out what are the proper role of government is in terms of regulatory intervention? And how do we bring the community together around a solution that works for everyone? So, the drivers. So first of all, so Blue Cross covers about 2.9 million people in Massachusetts. We spend almost $13 billion in paying for care every year. And when we take in, for every dollar of premium we collect, this is how it's distributed. So about 40 cents on the dollar goes to pay for hospital care for our members. Another 32% that professional, that's mostly physician services. So right there, 75%, of, uh, 75 cents on every dollar that we collect goes back out to buy care for our members. Another, another, Ancillary refers to nursing home and home health, and then almost 14% in drug costs. Now, if I were giving this talk 10 years ago, I would tell you almost my biggest concern was the rise in pharmacy costs. But they've actually stabilized. Uh, some fewer drug discoveries, more use of generic drugs, more use of formularies. Probably all of you have experienced these two or three tier formularies that we've grown pretty accustomed to. And interestingly, only about 10%, only 10 cents on the dollar actually goes back to the insurance company to pay for salaries and um, uh, administrative services, uh, computer systems to pay, pay for claims, et cetera. And actually, unfortunately, in Blue Cross, we've actually been losing money in the last few years, which is not healthy for us. Um, and so the question is, if 90 cents on the dollar goes back out to pay for care, um, how, do we, how do we address that? Another way, I just showed you that our costs are growing at 10% a year or so. So I just want to show you how that breaks down because it's important to understand that in terms of understanding the solution. Um, half of the increase in costs, and now this pie is not, is the money going to doctors or hospitals or pharmacy? This is, is the money going to the price of care or the use of care or the location of care? And so half the increase in our, what we call our medical trend is going to increase prices that we pay doctors, hospitals, and other providers of care. So half of it is in price. And for those who are interested, there's a great article in the Washington Post yesterday about how in the national debate this issue of prices and prices increasing was absent from the debate altogether. What people focused on was another <coughs> important thing, but the use. So if we pay, just to kind of break this big, if we pay $1,000 for hospital admission. The unit cost is how much is that increasing year over year? The utilization is how many services? What's the increase in services? And then finally, the provider mix is where are people getting their care? And it turns out in Massachusetts, the place people are getting their care is changing all the time. So already, we see um, care moving from outpatient care to hospital care, from community hospitals to academic hospitals. And every time that happens, the costs go up, up. We pay about $700 for an MRI in a community facility like Shields Healthcare, you may say the answer. We pay double that, sometimes triple that. Same MRI in an academic hospital. Same equipment, sometimes even the same radiologist reading it. Now there are reasons why care is more expensive than academic facilities, and we all know they play a vital role both in our economy and in our community. But um, this is where the costs are increasing. Now, some people, when faced with this choice, might say, well, the market has failed us. If costs are growing at such a rapid rate, then shouldn't government just come in and intervene and set the prices or decide the market? And Governor Patrick got so frustrated and understandably frustrated 
and he had called meetings in, and he had called the hospital leaders in, and he had called the health plan leaders in before my, my particular tenure. And he kind of banged his fist on the table and said, it's, it's too much. It's going up too fast when you do something. And he felt he didn't get a, an appropriate response. And so what he did, and some of you may have read about this, he directed his insurance commissioner, and I think at the urging of some former governors who might be present in the room tonight, <laughs> uh, to consider actually setting the rate that employers like Blue Cross or Harvard Pilgrim or Tufts could charge to small businesses in the Commonwealth. Um, it was an understandable act. It was an act of uh, frustration, I think, and exasperation. But I don't think it actually got to the underlying cost of care because if you hold our premiums down, unless we are able and successful and then turn back that 90 cents on the dollar that we go and pay for hospitals and physician care, unless we can similarly cap their costs, which is very challenging to do in this marketplace, then all you, all you do is you haven't really constrained the cost altogether. But what I would tell you is I think this debate that goes on in our community sometimes between is the market the answer or is government the answer is somewhat a false choice. And what we really have to think about is how do we balance these two things? Because what I would argue for you is that if you're a hospital, half your payments today come from the Medicare and the Medicaid program. They are set today. It's, it's, it's an administrative price system that's set essentially by the government. The other half of your revenue comes from commercial and private payers like Blue Cross and others. And so we already have a mixed system. And so I think the proper question is not, is it government regulation or is it the market? But what is the right balance between the two? How can we maintain the innovation that I think the market can provide, and you're gonna hear more about that from Reggie, with some of the oversight that is probably necessary in, for a public good uh, like healthcare. And so I think the solution is really thinking differently about how we pay for care. And so I have the privilege of actually being one of the governor's 10 appointees on something called the Payment Reform Commission in Massachusetts, which took a step back. We have the coverage reform. We have this cost problem. How are we going to deal uh, with, with solving it? And what we really thought about was paying differently for care. And so just to think about this, today, we're in what's called the fee-for-service system. And so right now in healthcare, we pay by the procedure, by the visit, by the admission. My mother, when she has a health problem, she calls her physician up. Most of the problems can be dealt with by the phone. He says, please come in and see me. He's, not, he's a good guy, he's a good doctor. That's the only way he gets paid. He doesn't get paid if he talks to her on the phone. He doesn't get paid if she sends him an email. And so we, we get what we pay for in our system. When we get, we pay for visits and procedures and admissions. And we pay more for more complex procedures, more complex admissions. If an outpatient practice at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is a quarter mile from here, successfully manages a group of patients who are Blue Cross members who have a chronic illness like heart, congestive heart failure or diabetes. They're and they successfully manage it so the patients are not admitted to the hospital. Their reward from Blue Cross is that they're paid less. If they don't do the follow-up and their patients get more ill and need to be admitted to the hospital, their reward is they get paid more. Isn't that system backwards? If someone is admitted to the hospital and they contract a preventable infection, the hospital gets paid more. If, if they prevent the infection, they get paid less. So we step back and say, can we change the incentives in the system? Can we move from this fee-for-service system, which incents volume, services, and does nothing about what patients feel is the, one of the greatest problems in the system, which is it's fragmented, it's not coordinated. And so what we recommended was replacing this fee-for-service system with coordinated care payments, what we call global payments. What some of you may remember was in the 80s and the 90s called capitation, which was such an ugly word in every respect um, that at least in our building, when we developed an alternative system, I said there would be a dollar fine every time the person <laughs> used the word capitation just so we could manage it from our uh, professional vocabulary. But what we came up with was a system um, in which we pay a fixed amount for our members per month to a group of physicians and hospitals that work together. And when they perform better, when they prevent those infections, when they perform better 
on uh, making sure that uh, kids get their screening, that women get their mammograms, that people over 50 get the colonoscopies, we'll pay them a bonus. And what do they do in return? In return, they agree that that rate of growth that was 10 and 11%, that they'll take it down year after year after year, try to cut it in half down to the level of 3, 4, or 5%, which is the rate of inflation. And we started this, and we called it something called the AQC, which is, stands for the Alternative Quality Contract. And you could tell we didn't have our marketers looking at this program because we wouldn't have called it something like that. And we actually, after a year, decided to change the name, but the problem was that it had already stuck. And what we thought would be a small pilot that a few pioneering physician practices would, would adopt has become now the largest private sector payment experiment in the country. And so we now have um, all these physician groups and hospitals that are accepting accountability for quality and cost. They're feeling liberated, the physicians are feeling liberated from that kind of treadmill of only performing, uh, you know, only getting paid for, for visits and admissions and tests and procedures. We now have about a third of our HMO members in Massachusetts, about 325,000 people and about a third of our primary care physicians and specialists accepting this form of payment and, being, and feeling liberated by it and agreeing to, uh, to reduce the rate of growth over time. And I met today with one of the physician leaders in these practices and he said, we have a few years in which we have to take about 20% of the cost out of our system. And he and I agreed, if we don't do it, then I would maybe defer to my former boss, former governor sitting in the room, who would ask government to step in in a bigger way. Because if we, if the community can't solve the problem, uh, then I think we should do this. And we're seeing, by the way, we have some control groups. The Commonwealth Fund has funded an evaluation of this new program that's being conducted by experts at the Harvard Medical School. The early results are in. Quality is up and costs are down. And uh, this uh, Medicare, is looking at this. We've been down repeatedly. I'm joined here by Jay Curley, one of my colleagues from Blue Cross, and he and his team have been down in Washington sharing the results with the new Center for Innovation uh, in, in Medicare, and I think it's, it's really promising. So what the new governor has to do is, I think, adopt these Payment Reform Commission recommendations more broadly. And what the governor can do is the government is a big purchaser of care. So we, we talked about you know, what is the regulatory role of government, but how about the role of government as purchaser? Why can't Medicaid, which is the second biggest health insurer in the state after Blue Cross, why can't they start to pay in a more innovative way? And I've talked with Secretary Bigby about this. Why can't the Group Insurance Commission that insures state employees and retirees and some municipalities pay in a more innovative way? And we've talked to Dolores Mitchell about that. I think if we do that, we could all come together and really have that same spirit of shared responsibility which led to the coverage reform. And I'll just end with the end, conclude tonight by um, some of us, the governor included, may remember back in the 60s, there was a expression, it was, it was a bumper sticker at the time, I think Eldridge Cleaver may have been the author of this, which said, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Well, actually, I think there's probably a more contemporary expression of it, because I think that everyone has to get together. And in this case, I think if you're not part of the problem, <laughs> you cannot be part of the solution. I would suggest to you that we are all part of the problem. Physicians, patients, health plans, employers, universities, regulators, professors, we're all part of the problem because we've been staying, accepting this healthcare system which doesn't pay for volume of care, doesn't pay for the value of care. And I think if we have a community can come together around value, we can have the same kind of progress that we had around coverage and have it instead around this question about affordability. So I look forward to the, uh, the questions and conversations later. Thank you.